What I would say to governments who are building these digital identities of their citizens, assume it will be stolen. So how are you building it? Assume it ends up in the wrong hands. Will it be something usable? Or will you have built it in a way that if somebody steals it, it no longer works? Hello, everyone. I'm Charles Lobo, Regional Risk Officer for Visa for the Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa region. In this special episode of Visa Spotlight, we have a very special guest, Teresa Payton, who is the first female CIO at the White House. Teresa brings a wealth of experience, including her time at the White House as the first female CIO. Teresa, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's jump right in, Teresa. Could you elaborate on how AI-driven deception is just changing the landscape of cybersecurity? And what are some of the specific challenges for businesses? Yeah, it's interesting. It's such a great question to kick off this conversation with. I saw the term the other day, weaponized familiarity. And I think that sums up what we're looking at here. So even though this is a tremendous time with technology and there's so many energizing, positive things about technology, we're seeing where that sense of trust that we've developed Mm -hmm. when we do digital transactions is actually being used against us on a speed and scale we haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. And that makes a lot of sense, uh, Teresa. In your experience, What are some of the most effective strategies for designing secure digital systems? Yeah, this is a tough one right now. um, And it's it's changing because we're seeing sort of this hyper-personalization of attacks on the individual. So really what we have to do is take a step back and focus on that human user story and really design technology around them. How does it enable them? And then once you really understand that human user story, that's when you can layer in your privacy and security strategies on top of that. So it's not getting in the way of the user. It's actually a safety net that's around the user. Okay. So so in that context, can you give us some real world examples of this deep fake manipulation and the fraud networks that you've actually encountered Yeah, in your experience? And how can we as businesses stay ahead? Because that's really what we are trying to figure out. You know, first, I have to say, I really appreciate the business community thinking about this. And you're already doing a great job. You know, no one wakes up and says, consumers on their own or my customers are on their own and I hope they figure it out. You know, everybody's so concerned about how can I deliver stellar service? How can I deliver self-service? Do it in a way that's seamless and elegant. And, oh, how do I keep the fraudsters and the cyber criminals from getting in between me and my customers. Mm -hmm. And so businesses are already doing a lot today, but certainly we can do more. And a couple of things besides doing uh, education of your employees and your customers, that's that's helpful, but that's not going to stop bad things from happening. So this is where thinking about designing for the human user story, but also looking ahead at some of the predictions that I've had about sort of the misuse of quantum computing, the misuse of... AI technology Mm -hmm. and that in the wrong hands is going to make it harder to actually use just a traditional checklist of defenses. Yeah. So really thinking ahead to, well, if quantum computing is in the hands of cyber criminals and of fraudsters, what can I do differently today to get ready for that? Sure. Sure. So um, I'd like to riff on that. uh, Exactly. So, you know, you you've talked about your predictions and you've given us a small snippet. You know, as we're preparing for 2026 and beyond, can you deep dive a little more into that? So what are the key trends and threats that we should be aware of? Yeah. Uh, So I I want you to give us a little more about your predictions. Yeah, sure. Um, So for starters, you already see, let's talk about some of the fraud rings today and then we'll get into the predictions. So we already see with the fraud rings, not only are they doing business email compromise on a speed and scale They weren't as successful at before. Now they can sort of, um, language isn't a barrier anymore. You know, if you're not a native English speaker, that's okay. Um, If you are trying to reach out to somebody from Texas, you can actually 
use a, a Gen AI, any of the tools like a chat GPT or any of the tools and say, hey, I really want to target my audience to be people who do banking in Texas mm -hmm. and use a tone like Matthew McConaughey. And the next thing you know, you've got a very convincing sounding email and you sound like you're from that area. And so you yep. can do all of your research for free, mm -hmm. set it up for free, and then the fraud groups are off and running to the races. Yeah. Fast forward with my predictions. They, there have been past data breaches of our fingerprints, of our facial recognition, yes. of all of our personal identifiable information, mm -hmm. but also our biometrics. And so if you take that combination of our personal information, our biometrics, and then you put in the hands, generative AI and quantum computing in the hands of a fraud ring, they're going to be able to produce your identity and my identity with some level of accuracy, with speed and scale, cost barriers start to go down. And they'll be able to do a digital walk-in on your life or my life, and it'll be hard for us to convince our banks yeah. or anybody else that that's not me who's conducting this transaction. So we have to be designing for that now because that day is coming where we will have digital identity walk-ins, and it'll be hard to eradicate them from our actual true identity. Yeah. You know, we are, we are in um, South Africa. We are in a part of the world that's developing very fast. And it's not just South Africa, but it's the region per se, where a number of governments are embarking on building out digital identities and digital databases. What advice would you have in the context of what you've just shared with us? Because part of building these databases is actually collecting those digital imprints of either fingerprints or irises and, and things like that. What advice would you have and do you see governments working with firms to secure these databases? Because that's really the, the crux of the issue. What could go wrong? Being able to protect all this information we've collected. We've been saying for decades now, almost my entire career, we have to protect this, we have to protect that. Let's have regulatory fines in case companies don't take it seriously enough. And what I would say to governments who are building these digital identities of their citizens, assume it will be stolen. So how are you building it? Assume it ends up in the wrong hands. Will it be something usable? Or will you have built it in a way that if somebody steals it, it no longer works? Mm. You know, if you think about uh, a car, for example, what modern day car technology has done, and it, it's a constant race because it's constantly evolving. But right now, if somebody tries to steal your car, mm -hmm. if your car gets too far away from your key, the car will stop working. Yes. Or you can do a remote command with the car company and say, that's not me driving the car. Can you stop the car? Sure. What do we have for digital identities? Are, are governments mm. actually building in that creativity and design? Are they actually assuming at the starting gate, this is going to be stolen? Mm. So how do we make it unusable? unreadable. And sadly, I don't hear that in design. So I hear things, well, we're going to store on the blockchain, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. We've learned the lessons hard way over and over again. Nothing is forever impenetrable. Nothing. So, so in that context, you know, we've talked a lot about tokenization of, of data. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in the context of that about tokenization? You know, Visa has been a proponent of tokenization for for credentials, payment mm -hmm. credentials. And we've seen some wonderful results in that. But yet again, one cannot rest on our laurels. So we're constantly trying to advance on that technology. In the in the domain of digital identities and digital data of personal data, what are your thoughts about tokenization? Absolutely necessary. Can't be the only thing you do, but yes, Visa has been a leader of tokenization for many years. I'm a huge fan of it. And now we're finally getting to the point with computer processing power that the compute cost is going to come way down and the speed at which you can do tokenization is going to go up. Because yeah. in the past, sometimes, depending on the transaction, the consumer might not have had patience for it, right? Yes. And But now we're at that point where the technology is caught up to the design idea mm -hmm. and it's absolutely essential and necessary. I would love to see tokenization pretty much of everything. So it's like you get a one-time tokenization of my voice. Mm -hmm. And once you use it for this one-time authorization and authentication, 
the next time you get a tokenization of my voice, it'll be a different token. Mm -hmm. And so I love this idea of integrating that technology that's been around for a while, but it's been hard to make it feel frictionless. Correct. Correct. And so some of the technologies that we've been talking about and we are on the verge of launching in our markets are things like payment pass keys, mm -hmm. where you, you create, it's highly secure, it's created one time, but then can be reused to eliminate the friction because that's the other thing that consumers don't like is the is the friction. They want the security, but they don't like the friction. So finding that sweet spot that is something... That fast and frictionless. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, Teresa, I want, to, I want to wrap up with my last question uh, and just reflecting on your, your time in the White House. I'm sure that was quite epic. Yeah. Uh, are there learnings from that time that are still relevant today that you still hold on to? Are there elements that you, you know, found in your development that are still relevant for today's times? Yes. And this one's going to sound counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. I thought about, I, I, I'm, I've thought about your question a lot. And one of my biggest lessons learned from my time at the White House was to live in awe and live in analog. And as a technologist, that sounds counterintuitive. But every day, be grateful and in awe of the work that you're doing. And the day that you're not, you're in the wrong field. And living in analog really makes you think twice about how you design technology and how you make sure the technology is serving us as humans versus the other way around. I mean, sometimes, doesn't it feel like you're feeding a beast sometimes? You type in this and then do this and then do this thing and do that thing. It's like, wait, I thought technology was supposed to serve me. I feel like I'm serving it. Yeah. So I, that, my biggest takeaways are to live in awe and to live in analog. Um, and then I would say followed by, as technologists, we often are, it's almost like every problem can be solved with technology. Like we're constantly thinking, how can I optimize this? And how can I do this differently? And if only I could retire this and do something new with newer technology, it would be better. And I would challenge you that, Again, just take a deep breath and talk to the humans who are using the technology and really understand before they even touch the keyboard or their smartphone uh, or used voice, what were they doing before? What are they multitasking and doing while they're doing the thing yeah. on the technology? And what are they going to be doing after? You're going to design a system so much better around really understanding what they're bringing in that moment that the transaction's happening? Are they a distracted user? Are they a, a, a very focused, engaged user? And, and so those design stories change depending on sort of the user story behind it. And, and I would say, you know, coming from financial services, obviously we always thought about seamless, frictionless, yes. and all the regulatory burdens that come with that. But it was really some hard learned lessons when I got, you know, kind of in the White House operations tempo that uh, some of those new lessons learned came to me. Fantastic. So on that note, Teresa, I'd like to thank you very much. I love the line, live in awe and live in analog. Um, I think that's something I'm going to reflect on. But thank you very much. This has been a terrific exchange of thoughts and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>